How do you craft compelling sentences? Right, this is one of the fundamental things you have to know in order to write something great, because if you can't craft compelling sentences, then your reader is not going to stick around long enough to actually get to the end of your story. So there's lots of stuff that goes into doing this, but I recently hosted a live training where I walked people through three different exercises that they can use to actually improve their line-by-line -line writing and keep readers reading. So what you're about to watch is a lightly edited recording of that training, and we're just going to jump in so that you can learn alongside them on how to craft compelling sentences. So let's get in there and get started. For those of you that don't know much about me, my name is Tim Grawl. I'm a writer and I'm the CEO of StoryGrid. I've been working with writers uh, for 15 years. And then everything that I teach today and is, comes uh, from Sean Coyne, who's the founder and creator of StoryGrid. And then alongside him is Danielle Kiowski, the chief academic officer for StoryGrid, and Leslie Watts, the editor and chief of StoryGrid Publishing. The reason why StoryGrid exists is to help you learn the skills to write a book to leave your legacy. This isn't just about, you know, churning out a manuscript and throwing it up on Amazon. This is about actually learning how to write. When you signed up for this training, I promise to teach you uh, three things. How to valence your language to unboring your sentences. Use objects of desire to write compelling characters. Decide what details to include and cut to keep your readers engaged. And some of you may have caught in my email this other little promise I made, which you would actually leave today a better writer. That's a big promise, and I want you to hold me to it. So uh, your job is to pay attention, participate, because this this is uh, something we're all going to do together, and then I'm going to check back in with you to make sure I actually followed through on all of this stuff. All right. Is everybody ready? Uh, I need a thumbs up in the uh, chat if everybody's ready to do this. So give me a thumbs up or a smiley face or something in there. Yeah, show the screen. Awesome. Fantastic. Yes. All right. Everybody's ready. Here we go. Let's just start. How do you unboring your sentences? Okay. So what do we mean by this? All right. Who wants to unboring their sentences, right? How many times have you gone back and read some of your own writing and you're like, oh my God, this is horrible. This is boring. I don't want to do this anymore. All right. Yes. All right. Omar's raising his hand. I see him. Fantastic. We've all been there. Um, so I'm going to teach you the thing that helped me unboring my sentences. All right. So first, let's just look at some examples. I find that a lot of times I like to just start by looking at some examples. So this sentence, he was thinking negatively. All right. So the question here is, is that a bad or a good thing? All right. Do we know by these four words whether or not he was thinking negatively. Is that a bad or a good thing? Because sometimes it's good to think negatively, right? You, you, if it's a bad thing, I should think negatively about it. And when we're saying thinking, are we actually think is it is he feeling negative? Is he logically thinking negative things? Like, right, it's passive. Lots of people are saying that kind of vague. Um, the the road to hell is paved with adverbs. All right, um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So now let's look at another version of this sentence. So this sentence is from a book that like rocked me like 530 in the morning. I'm sobbing on the couch next to my wife and she's looking at me like I'm crazy. Tomorrow, tomorrow and tomorrow by Gabriel Zevin. His brain was treacherously negative. Ooh. Okay. So it's five words long instead of four, but we get so much more out of this, right? So it's not just he was thinking, it's his brain. So what does that tell us? It's almost like it's biological, right? It's like this idea that this negativity isn't coming just from his logical brain or his emotional thing. It's like it's coming from his biology. And that word treacherous is dangerous, right? That means it's dangerous. So now we know what Gabrielle thinks about this character thinking negatively. We think it's coming from his brain and this is a dangerous thing. And this is why having that quote from uh, Stephen King about, you know, the road, what is it? The road to hell is paved with adverbs. You can't just say that because this is a fantastically used adverb right here. 
because now we know what that word negative means, right? We know that Gabriel thinks this is a dangerous thing, all right? Let's look at another example. All right, words given to a child, whether intentionally or unintentionally, stay in their memory and can affect them later. Again, is this a good or a bad thing? Is this a positive or a negative thing, right? Well, I kind of immediately when I read it, I'm like, oh, that's a bad thing. Bad things happen to kids. Well, actually, this is a good thing, too. I remember uh, I was talking with this woman one time that did a lot of uh, she did the foster care, like when a child was first taken out of the home until they could find another place for it to go. And my wife was talking to her and asked, like, you know, that's got to be hard. And she's like, my job is to just program love into them as much as I can so that later when they feel it, they'll know what it is. And I'm like, oh, that's beautiful. And that's like a positive version of this. So again, looking at this, uh, it's long-winded. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it's just a statement. Yes, yeah, Stephanie's like, it's just a statement. Could be either positive or negative. Sharon said that, right? All right, so now if we pull this line from one of my favorite books, The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon, now, what does he think about this? And I'm not going to say anything. You guys put it in the chat. What does this author think about the fact that words given to a child, whether intentionally or unintentionally, stay in their memory and can affect them later? Destructive. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah. He's negative. Remain branded. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the meaning transformed. The author hates the fact that this happens. Absolutely. Harmful words last forever. Only negative. Strong words like poison burn the soul, ignorance, branded, burn. Yeah, bad things happen. Fantastic. You're seeing it, right? You're seeing that now it's a little bit longer, but it's saying the exact same thing, except now we know Carlos has an opinion on this, right? All right, let's look at another one. Uh, I think this is, yeah, this is the last one here. All right. They were greeted by their grandparents, two people in dark clothes. The children liked them immediately. All right. Now let's look at Ann Tyler's, right? This is from Accidental Taurus, another book I read this year that just rocked me. They were met by their grandparents, two thin, severe, distinguished people in dark clothes. The children approved of them at once. So what does this say about the children, right? So tell me in the chat, what does this say about the children? And they were, they're from the Adams family. Yeah. Children are judgy. Good. Um, fast to judge, they relate, um, they're vampires, the children are mature, good, they made a judgment, yep, absolutely. Does it maybe say they, uh, they too might be severe people, right? They want structure, good, yeah. So again, you can see how just switching a few words out, adding some descriptors in there. We now know what Anne thinks about what's going on. And what this means is your writing should have an opinion. This is a thing we see over and over and over at StoryGrid when we're looking at people's writings is they almost like report what's going on as if they're like godlike or omniscient or uh, impassive to the whole thing. But you have to understand the reason you're writing a book is to cause a transformation in the reader. So you have to have an opinion about what's going on so that the reader can track with you about what they're supposed to think. So when we're talking about valencing your language, when we use this word valence at StoryGrid, this is what we mean. Your writing needs to have an opinion. It needs to be pushing the reader one way or another dep depending on what's going on. Every single word needs to push the reader to, tra to the transformation or change you want them to make. So we're going to talk about how to know which way to push them. We're going to do that in another exercise here. But for now, let's just look at how to do this, okay? So first of all, there's three places to valence your language. And they need you need to look at them in this order, okay? The first is verbs. We need to valence the verbs. Your verbs cannot be passive. They And this is different than like passive language where it's like instead of like, he hit the ball and the ball was hit by him, right? That's passive. I'm talking about the actual word you're using, okay? First, we look at verbs. Second, we look at nouns. And third, if we can't get all the way there by just choosing the right verbs and nouns, 
then we add in descriptors like adjectives and adverbs. So this is where, um, again, uh, I forgot who posted that quote from uh, Stephen King about the the road to hell is paved with adverbs. This is what it means. is like if you don't valence your verbs and nouns and then you just stuff it full of adjectives and adverbs, that's what doesn't work, right? So we got a valence in this order, okay? So let's just look at some examples together of just pulling out single words and looking at how we can valence those, all right? So of course, we're going to look at verbs first. So the verb walk. So if we just say the man walked down the street, all right, and we're just going to look at walk. What do we know about what's going on? Nothing, because all he's doing is walking down the street. But what if I say the man strolled down the street? Well, now it's like, okay, well, I can kind of picture that a little bit. Like he's going easy. Maybe he's looking around. Um, what if I said he's marched down the street? It's like, okay, well, he's he's going somewhere, right? He is on his way somewhere. There's a purpose. He's probably not like glancing up at the sky. He's going somewhere on purpose. Sauntered. There's now that this is even like better than strolled because there's like a laziness to it. Strutted. Now we think this guy's maybe dressed really nice. Maybe he thinks a lot of himself there. You know, he thinks he's 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 a bee's knees, as my mom says. Um, the man prowled down the street. This almost tells us what time of day it is. Now, not necessarily, but it starts even leaning like, oh man, I, if I just picture somebody prowling down the street, I'm like, oh, it's night out. He's trying to get away with something, right? The man lived down the street. Well, now we know something about the man himself, right? So this gives us more information about the man. Something's up with him, with his body. The man scampered down the street, right? Again, now I'm just picturing like a small man moving like a chihuahua. All right, so give me some more. Give me Some of you have given me some more and they were just rolling through the chat, but give me some more. What are some other ones for walk? Trudge, that's a good one, David. Danced, meandered, charged, slunk. Yeah, sashayed, sprinted, limped. Oh, I, I did limped. You took mine. All right, stomped, twerked, twerked down the street. How about that? Weave down the street. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are great. Giddy up down the street. Fantastic. Skip down the street. Right. So you're getting it, right? You're starting to be like, just by changing one word, we can send a lot more information to the reader about what's going on and about how I see it. Just look at the one strutted, right? So now you know that me, the author, thinks that guy's a little stuck up, right? You are getting my opinion on what's going on. So let's look at another one. All right. She killed the man. All right. Again, well, it's it's hard to like, it just, if you just picture she killed the man and you literally try to only picture those words, it's hard to like get a bead on a picture, right? But what if I say she assassinated the man? Oh, okay. Well, that's a little different. Maybe there's a silencer on that gun. Uh, maybe she's dressed in dark clothing. She kind of knows what she's doing. Do you think if she assassinated the man, do you think this is the first time she's killed somebody? No, 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 no. Right. She executed the man. She slaughtered the man. All right. Think about the amount of blood on the floor between assassinated and slaughtered. Right. There's a lot more blood and slaughtered. Right. There's some anger there. What about if I say she euthanized the man? Oh, well, maybe this is an act of mercy. Maybe he wanted to die, right? Like now we start getting something else. Um, she annihilated the man. She snuffed out the man, right? All right, let me look at some of you have been putting them in here. Poison the man, stab the man. So I had poisoned, but I was worried that it didn't actually mean kill because you can poison somebody, but they may not be dead, right? Garroted the man, uh, shot the man, anesthetized the man, decimated the man. Awesome. Uh, disintegrated, bludgeoned, disemboweled, dissolved. Yeah. She finished the man. Good. Obliterated. Yeah. Butchered. I like butchered. Maybe that says some more about me. All right. So you see here, right? Again, with one word, we can start, we can change. Again, 
think about just the three assassinated, slaughtered, and euthanized. Like those are three completely different stories, right? Um, all right. So now let's look at a couple nouns. All right. Dog. What if instead I said mutt? We picture maybe something more like the picture uh, that I have here. Um, what if I said purebred, right? We start picturing two different things just by changing the noun. Or if I say pit bull, or if I say stray, or if I say chihuahua, right? Wolf. Yeah, I see here. Mongrel. You guys can put it in the chat. A uh, hellhound, pooch, pug. <laughs> I have two pugs. Um, yeah, puppy. Good. Canine, beast, fur baby. Uh, yeah. Companion, shepherd. Well, shepherd. You might not picture a dog. Let's see. Uh, yeah. Ankle biter. That's a good one. Uh, fluff ball. Exactly. Collie. Yeah, yeah. You're getting it, right? So just now, like, just by changing the noun and the verb, we're getting very different things, right? All right, book. Uh, before I give some, why don't you give someone this one? What are some different things? Tomb, tome. Yeah, lots of people said tome. Awesome. Uh Let's see. I don't know how to say that word. Uh, Doorstopper. Manuscript. Comic. Manual. Good. Volume. Textbook. Grim Noir. Pamphlet. Novel. Journal. Encyclopedia. Parchment. Leatherbound. Good. Yeah. Treatise. Chapbook. Paperback. Master Ledger. Great. I'm going to give you mine. You, some of you, you guys got these already. Page Turner. Doorstop. Tearjerker, Mindbender, Thriller. Good. Anthology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So we've looked at a couple verbs. We've looked at a couple nouns. Let's look at a couple descriptors. All right. Let's look at the word tall. All right. What's interesting about a word like tall is that is it is a comparison word, right? So no, you can't have ten everything be tall, right? Something has to be tall in comparison to something that is shorter than it, right? Yeah, so towering, giant, you guys are already, you, you guys have caught on it to what Lakey, yeah, good. Gargantuan, still, long-legged, vertically gifted. Uh, let's see, monstrous, good. Yeah, okay, I'll give you mine. So towering, you guys did that one, Lanky, right? So Lanky, what do you what do you picture when you picture Lanky, right? A little, maybe, um, they, maybe they will trip over somebody. They stumble a little bit. Their arms and legs are too long. Uh, fun fact about me, I did that 23 and me spit in the thing. And uh, it came back that I was in the 91st percentile for the Neanderthal gene. And so like just this weekend, I had to go get measured for shirts. And the lady measures me. And she's like, the length of your arms are what people that are 6'2 and 6'3. And I'm 5'11. I'm like, yeah, that's because I'm a Neanderthal. I have long arms and I'm hairy. Uh, anyway, that has nothing to do with this. So you get that one for free. All right, giant, gangly. Let's see, statuesque, lofty. Yeah, gangly. Look, very good job. Ahead above everyone else. You have Abe Lincoln arms. Okay, I don't know if you're just like putting that in as a joke, but that's exactly what we're talking about with valency, right? I know exactly what you mean with that description. Mountainous, yeah, skyscraper. All right, let's look in an adverb quickly. I'm just going to let you all go first again. You guys are coming up with better ones than I did. Swiftly, speedy, zoomed, urgently, immediately, precip pre precipitously, expeditious. Man, you got <laughs> expeditiously. There we go. Impatiently, frantically. I think I have frantically. Yeah. So I put leisurely, that's actually not that quickly, abruptly, swiftly. Again, you're seeing like, you're, you're getting it, right? All right, so now, that wasn't even the exercise. I was just getting your help on, on those. I want you guys to put in the chat, I want you to write a different version of this sentence. The man sat in the chair. I want you to valence it and then put it in, okay? The man slouched in the armchair. Good. The man descended on his throne. Awesome. 
The gentleman lazed in the rocking chair. He squirmed in his rickety seat. The man sank into the chair. Okay, now I want you to do it. Um, what if the man was either really small, like three feet tall, or really big, like uh, six, eight, four hundred pounds? The man collapsed into the chair. The let's see, so, so make it where the man is either really small or really big. He perched on the bar stool. That's a good one. Yeah. Tom Thumb climbed himself. Oh man, it's moving too fast. Hold on, I'm, I lost it. Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb climbed into the high chair. The man stuffed himself into the chair. That's that's great. The man disappeared into the oversized lounge chair. Yeah. The man pulled himself into the chair. The huge man perched on the chair. The waif sank into the recliner. I like that because you changed man. The tiny guy was swallowed by the armchair. Great. The man hopped into the chair. The chair collapsed under the man. Uh, the man lowered himself into the chair. Yeah. Uh, the armchair creaked beneath his great weight. That's fantastic. Right, so you didn't even say, yeah, that's so good. Um, the Colossus, the miniature man sat cross-legged in the armchair. The elf-like retiree slouched into the metal chair. Great. Okay, now, um, now I want you to do versions. I want to know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that he's in the chair. Can you do that? Is it a good thing or a bad thing that he's in the chair? All right, I'm sorry. I would read all of these, but there's over 200 people here, and I just got to do my best. I love, I love these. So again, we're trying it now. I want to know by reading your sentence if it's a good thing or a bad thing that the man is in the chair. The man reluctantly sat on the edge of the chair. Yeah, that makes me feel like oof. He does not want to be there. He collapsed into the nearest chair. Yeah, that's another good one. The condemned trembled as he waited for the high voltage. That's definitely bad. Um, his arms were chained to the chair. Yeah, good. He sat uneasily at the edge of his seat. Good. Is it is it saying something about us as writers that nobody's done a good one yet? Uh, <laughs> uh, the killer sat, his back stiff, the electrodes attached to his sweating head. Everybody's wanting to kill everybody in the chair. All right, uh, this is great. I mean, it's where my mind would go first, too. He stiffened in his seat. That's a good one. I like that one. Uh, the large man perched on the edge of his seat. See, that could still be good or bad. I'm leaning towards good, but I'm not sure if that's good or bad. The chair creaked dangerously beneath his weight. He limped into the chair, legs shaking as he slowly, slowly lowered himself. Yeah. Um. Great. So what I want you to see here, all right, we got to keep moving. Um, this is so great. I want to just stay here, but we got two more exercises we got to do. All right. So what I want you to do is see that you can do this for any sentence on your own. All right. So a really good exercise is to take a, write a bland, unbalanced sentence and then write 10 or 20 versions of the sentence, right? Making, um, Focusing first on the verbs, then on the nouns, then adding adjectives and adverbs as necessary. And I want to know, is it a positive thing or a negative thing that the person's in the chair? Maybe it, the character thinks it's positive, but the author knows it's negative, right? So I need to know what the, uh, what the author thinks about what is going on, right? So this is just a really good way to just practice um, getting used to having an opinion about what's happening on the page. When you write a sentence, I should, if I read one, any one sentence, see, this is what's important is I should be able to pull out a sentence and it should be valenced. Okay. So how do you unboring, let's turn it into a question. How do you unboring your sentences? You valence the language. You make sure your verbs, your nouns, and your descriptors have an opinion about what's happening in the story. Okay, so that was that was thing number one is how to unboring your sentences, and you do that by valencing your language. So let's look at the second exercise. How do we write compelling characters? All right, who here struggles with writing compelling characters? Give me a thumbs up uh, or a sad face or something. Put it in the chat. Let me know who here struggles to write compelling characters. Yeah, 
Yeah. Awesome. Sad cat, Stephanie. I like that one. The writer was sad. <laughs> all right. Yes, we all we all do that. Um, if you have questions, hang on to them. I, write them down so you don't forget them. I don't want them to get buried. Um, and we'll get to those at the end during the Q&A. So, all right. So let's talk about how to write compelling characters. And to do that, we've got to talk about objects of desire. Okay. So what is an object of desire? All right. The object of desire is what your characters want. Each character needs to have something that they want and that in the scene, in each scene, they are actively pursuing that. If this is an active character in your scene, they need to have an object of desire, something they want, and that they're actively pursuing. And this is what drives all of the conflict in your story, is being super clear on the objects of desire. Now, where do people go wrong? This is not brand new information that your characters have to want something. You know, I can't claim this is the first person to say that, but I'll tell you where this goes wrong with objects of desire is that each of your characters has to have a different object of desire, it has to be different in one of three ways. Okay. This is where people get in trouble is that their characters want the same thing. Okay. Now, each character's object of desire must be different in one of three ways, all right? The first one is, this one's super clear and easy. They want something different, all right? So let's assume, let's imagine there's an interrogator and an, an interrogatee, right? Somebody being interrogated. So the interrogator wants to know what the interrogatee uh, saw, right? The, and the interrogatee does not want to tell, right? So that's very simple. Two different characters, they want something different. One wants to keep their mouth shut. The other one wants that person to talk, right? That's really simple. So that's number one. Or the why could be different. Maybe they want the same thing, but for different reasons. So let's add a third character to our scenario here. Now we, uh, so they're doing the interrogation. Maybe they're in one of those like uh, police interrogation rooms with like the table and chairs. And then there's the one-way glass. And sitting behind the glass is the interrogator's boss. Maybe it's his captain or something. And he wants the guy in there to talk, not because he wants to find out who did the crime. He wants a promotion, right? So him, so the boss and the interrogator want the same thing, but they want it for different reasons. One wants it because they want to solve the crime. The other one wants it because they want a promotion, right? So can you see... How even if the object of desire is the same, they want it for different reasons, and that can create conflict. Can you see that? Can you give me some nods if you got your, if you got your camera on. Are you seeing that? All right, great. The third way they can be different is they want the same thing, they want it for the same reason, but they're trying to get it in a different way. So we're going to add a fourth person to our scenario here. We're going to add a second interrogator, and one's a good cop and one's a bad cop. All right, so one wants to not waterboard the guy and the other one does want to waterboard the guy. They both wanted the guy to talk, so they want the same thing. They want it for the same reason. They want to solve the crime, but they're going to go about it a different way. Now, you have all of four people of these in a scene. Can you see how this starts creating all kinds of crazy conflict? Will the boss let the guy waterboard the interrogatee so that he can get his promotion? Oh, no, right? The conflict starts building because the objects of desire are different, right? So when we say the objects of desire are different, it's not that they necessarily want something different. It's that they either want something different, they want the same thing for different reasons, or they want the same thing for the same reasons, but are trying to get it in a different way. All right. Can you see this? All right. So now it's your turn. All right. So I'm going to give you a scenario. A mom, a dad, and their nine-year-old son are in a car on a 12-hour road trip. All right, don't start yet. Wait on me to tell you what I want you to do, all right? Um, otherwise, it'll get too jumbled in the chat. Mom, dad, and their nine-year-old son are in a car on a 12-hour road trip from Atlanta, Georgia, which is in the southeast of the United States, to Lancaster, P Pennsylvania, which is in the northeast, 12 hours apart. And they're going to visit two old college friends who recently got engaged to each other. So, what does the mom want? 
put in the chat what do you think the mom wants all right to see the ring peace to have a great time all right Woo. to shop on the way uh if you so anastasia says whose college friend is it uh, i don't know you come up with it if if i didn't give you the detail you make up the detail the mother wants to reunite with the sorority sister see an old friend wants to see her old lover oh interesting a leisurely drive mom wants to approve of the partner to go visit the woman great 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 all right um all right now what does the dad want what does the dad want to go back home, to get it over with, to please his wife, to get this over with, to get there with as few stops as possible, boast about his job, uh, to get it over with. <laughs> what is this thing about men? Uh, the kid to shut up, for the trip to be over, to go drinking with the guy. Dad wants to get there fast, stay home and watch football, night with the boys, uh, to be anywhere else, to watch the football game. All right, so dad wants to get there as quick as possible. All right, what does the kid want? Put in uh, the chat what the son wants. Potty break. Uh, stop at every McDonald's on the way. Uh, world domination. Play video games. Go to Hershey Park nearby. Ice cream in a new video game. Not to go. To stay home. A fully charged cell phone. Here are the objects of desire for each of the characters. I want you to give me 10 different, or just give me a way that the mom gets what she wants. How can she go about, what is she going to attempt to do to get her object of desire, which is to stop and shop on the way, knowing her husband doesn't want to make it in 12 hours. He wants to make it in 11 and her son wants to recharge his dead video game uh, console. <laughs> Naomi says, slash the tires in the mall parking lot. <laughs> Man, that's hardcore. All right. Uh, claim she has to use the restroom, point out the uh, all the outlet mall exits, shop on her phone, uh, constant complaining, tell the hubby to stop at a store as she had to go to the toilet. Um, she takes over driving and doesn't give him a choice. Um, if we stop at the mall, Junior can get a new charger. John, that's a good one, right? Because now she's she's trying to get her object of desire and her kid's object of desire, but to get her object of desire by saying she wants to help her kid get the object of desire, right? Um, says she'll buy him a new tool. Um, negotiate, hopefully, like an adult. Constantly chug water. That's the... I like that, right? Um, oh, man, that's good. All right, this is uh, suggest a lingerie shop at the next mall. Fantastic. All right, so tell me about uh, the dad. How is he going to try to make sure that he gets what he wants? He's using his own map. He's speeding. He's the driver. Stays in the left lane away from the exit. Doesn't let the mom drive. Ignore everybody and put his foot flat on the accelerator. Um, let's see. Ignore wife's complaint. Claim if they got there faster, they'll have time for shopping. Hey, see, that's a good one. So keep thinking about how they can interact and bump into each other. Because I understand putting your uh, foot to the accelerator, but how can they? How can they? They directly conflict. Or they, he can help one get one and get the other. So that's the idea of like, if we get there early, then we can shop. He buys a portable charger for his son. No stop, packed lunches, gives mom a timeline. He keeps missing the exits. <laughs> that's a good one. Uh, distract mom when he sees a mall sign. Maybe he starts a fight with her. Uh because then if they're fighting, he can keep driving. Budget woes, he can talk about money. Um, yeah, good. All right, how is the son? All right, so if we look at the three people in the car, the son probably has the least amount of power, right? Like pure, like, you know, he can't make the car stop. Um, he can't make them do anything. So how would he go about getting what he wants? Cry and be pathetic, complain to mom, whine and plead, pukes in the car, yeah. Kicking the back of the seat, 
if you love me, you'll stop. Let's see. Yeah. Says he has to go to the bathroom, hops up and down, gets car sick, ask a million questions. Uh, so almost like ignore, annoy them, but not by just asking over and over, just talk a ton. Um, are we there yet? Complaining the whole way. Yeah. All right. So here's what I want you to see. All right. If we put, can you imagine a scenario where somebody writes a full book about one car trip with three people in the car and it would be good and it would be interesting because their objects of desire are so conflicting. You could probably write a, think of a story, write a story where they get in the car, a happy couple, and they're separated by the time they make it to Lancaster, right? So think about, this is how you write compelling characters, is you get super clear on their objects of desire, and you make sure that they are conflicting object, objects of desire, that the people in your scene, in your book, cannot all get what they want. For one person to get what they want, the other people have to lose. This is how you create conflict. This is how you create compelling characters. And this is how you make sure you don't have boring characters is you cannot have, here's two big things. One is your every character has to want something. If they are an active character in your story, they've got to want something. And two characters cannot want the same thing for the same reasons and go about getting it the same way, right? So if like I change this to the kid also wants to stop and shop, they've got to want that for different reasons and they have to, or they have to go about getting that for different thing, for different ways, right? So how do you write compelling characters? You have to have clear and conflicting objects of desire and each person has to have one, one object of desire and they are actively pursuing it in the scene and they're trying to get it at the expense of other people's objects of desire, okay? This is also where you see in stories where like an antagonist and a protagonist start working together because they want the same thing, but they want it for different reasons. So they'll, you know, this is funny like rom-coms where the two guys that both want the girl will work together to like get rid of the other guy so then they both can have a chance, all right? So this is how you, if you're wondering, how do you write compelling characters? You make sure you have clear objects of desire for each one and that they're conf conflicting in one of those three ways, every single character, okay? All right, so that was exercise number two. Let's look at how do you keep your readers engaged, all right? And the way I put this is, how do you, um, how do you know what to cut and what to keep so that you're, it, it's not boring. Your readers stay engaged, all right? And this is where we're going to talk about the narrative device, all right? So the narrative device is made up of three things. So the first is the author. Who is telling the story? And not just you, the writer, because we know that, but it's like, what archetype of you is telling the story? Is it, uh, is it you the war hero? Is it you, the grandmother? Is it you, the dragon? Like who is telling the story? Okay. That's number one. And then who are they telling the story to, right? So who is reading this story? And we have to think about one particular person, one single audience member. We got to get super clear on who we're telling the story to, who is reading this story, right? So you have the author and they're telling a story to a single audience member to help that single audience member solve a problem. So why is Sam reading the story? Why is Sam listening to this story? All right. Now here's what I want you to understand. You do this every day in your life. You probably do it multiple times a day in your life. So think about the different ways that you interact and talk with maybe your partner, your husband or wife, uh, your kids, uh, your coworkers, uh, your boss, um, you know, your friend, somebody at uh, somebody that you meet at the gym, right? You interact with these people in different ways. Now, this doesn't mean that you're like lying. This isn't about like whether or not you're being fake or not. But it's like, if I am talking to my wife about something that happened 
I will talk completely different than if I'm talking to somebody I don't know that well, right? Um, I'll also talk differently if I know the person, if the person I'm talking to knows the person I'm talking about, or if they don't know the person I'm talking about, right? So what I want you to do is get in your head that you do this all the time, right? You talk to different people, different ways based on what you want from them, how you're interacting with them and how well you know them. Okay. So now we're going to give you a try at this and I'm going to give you your story. All right. So I'm giving you the story. When I was 17 years old, I got blackout drunk at a party and woke up in an emerald green banquet dress in high heels and a dumpster behind a Walmart. All right. This actually did happen to my cousin. All right. This didn't happen to me. This happened to my cousin. And this isn't like, you know, I have a friend, but it's actually me. Um, although sometimes I wish this did happen to me more often in high school. Anyway, so here's the story you're going to tell. When I was 17 years old, I got blackout drunk at a party and I woke up in an emerald green banquet dress and high heels and a dumpster behind a Walmart. All right. Now, who's telling this story? So now it is the 17 year old, but much later in his life, maybe he's 45 years old and he's a father and he's talking to his 17 year old son and his 17 year old son wants to go to a party where there's going to be alcohol. All right. Now, what details would the author include, exclude, and embellish? So put this into the chat. What details about this story would the author maybe leave out? The author might pump up or the author might uh, make sure they include. All right. The consequences. The dad had a great time. See, I don't know. It depends on what. Let's see. The negatives, how he felt afterwards, the regret, pump up the embarrassment, uh, the funniest detail, include the hangover and how much he got mocked for it by his school friends, leave out the dress and heels, include the hangover, exclude the fun. Uh, so the father is trying to scare his son straight and I'd expect him to embellish. What would he embellish to scare the son straight? Yeah, you would leave out the fun and the memories. Uh, Sam is the single audience member. Uh, I mentioned that in the previous slide. Single audience member, the person reading the book. Uh, include the regrets. Include the responsibility, the embarrassment, um, how sick he felt. Um, what would the moral of the story be? Uh, how did he end up wearing the dress of his girlfriend? Uh, is the Sam... The reader or the character? The reader, the reader. We're not talking about the character. The characters would be the 17-year-old. Um, let's see. Don't mention the photos that exist. Leave out that he brought the alcohol to the party. Good. The incentive of being cool and ending up the fool. Yeah. Uh, embellish the humiliation. Tell him about being out of control. Put in embarrassment. He would embellish the fear of the blackout. How much it costs him to set his reputation straight. Fantastic. Yeah, right? All right. So now let's switch it up a little bit. Same story. Same story. When I was 17 years old, I got blackout drunk at a party, woke up in an emerald green baker dress and high heels in a dumpster behind Walmart. Except now he's about the same age, 43, but he's reconnecting with a high school buddy at a bar and they're trying to reconnect over shared memories. Now... What details would the author include, exclude, and embellish? Yeah, embellish the cross-dressing. Do you remember that one time when the whole bottle, I drank the whole bottle of Jack, right? Embellish how much alcohol he can hold, uh, set, put the sex in, how much fun it was, man, we were young and dumb. Um, how much the high heels pinched. Good, yeah, right, a really specific detail. Um the girl he got the dress off and how she looked without it. Great. Include that he started to date the owner of the green dress. Maybe that's the mom. Why the friend laced his drink. Leave out that he felt ashamed later. Uh, yeah. All the crap you got me into. What he drank would be embellished. Humi humiliation would be downplayed, right? How good I looked. Yo, dude, remember that time we got blackout drunk and I woke up in the fucking dress? Jesus, didn't you end up chasing a squirrel half the night? Yeah. I won the bet. 
Uh, who the hell ended up with the red dress he started with? Yeah. Leave out Walmart. Argue over whose dress it was. Include all the details. Um, how he won the dare and became famous among the team. Deny, deny, deny. Yeah. Now, um, what kind of language would he use as opposed to when he's talking to a 17-year-old? How would the language change? How would valencing the language change? Yeah, F this and F that. He's going to cuss way more, more swearing. Um, oh, good one, John. The one where he talks to his 17-year-old is going to be cautionary. The one where he's talking to his friend is going to be a prescriptive tale. Um, yeah, it would be rough language, less strict and dicta dictator. Man, I cannot talk today. Uh, I'm not even going to try it anymore. Way more profane, fucking A, uh, enthusiastic tone, lots of bravado, lots of jokes, swearing, blame the friend for his current alcoholism. <laughs> uh, bragging, swearing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, no regrets going to show up in this story. Uh, memory lane. All right, great. Let's do a third one real quick. All right, so same story, except now... The story is being told like a week later. So he's 17 years old. Okay. And he's talking to a priest. And the priest wants to give him absol absolution. So now, what would the author include, exclude, embellish? What would the moral of the story be? And what kind of language would the author use? He probably wouldn't say a lot of fucking A if he's trying to get absolved, right? Show remorse. Blame his peers for peer pressuring. Yeah. Says he didn't know his Coke was spiked. I thought you meant cocaine. Yeah. I'm like, that's not going to help. But Coca-Cola. Yeah. Lots of apology and guilt. Try to blame others. Sorrowful language. Exclude. Uh, exclude the dress. Clean language. Maybe some tears. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I was tricked. I regret what I did. Include a lot of feelings and remorse. Leave out details and embellish the shame. Yep. Sorrowful language. Sterilize the language. Offer guilt. So now think about... Uh, yeah, very good. You guys are getting it. So think about a sentence like... Um, I should have put this in the slides. Um, something like... Um, the, the boy drank a beer at a party. But how would he say that to the priest? How would he valence that to his friend? How would he valence that to his son? The boy drank a beer at a party. Or he drank a beer at a party. I was stupid. I drank a beer. I want you to change the verbs, change the noun, and add good descriptors. We got wasted. I had a few. There was alcohol. Yeah. Good. Right? Oh, man. That was good. Yeah. I might have had a sip. Yeah. I chugged a ton of brewskis last night. Yes. Right? So he's telling... I Don't even tell me. I, can, I know. You were telling your friend that. Right? I sipped one beer. That's probably the priest. I stole a Budweiser and downed it. I chugged it, buddy. Yeah. We shotgunned that 12-pack. I didn't know the punch was spiked. The one beer hurt me. Big big hangover. Now, son, I did have a few beers. Yeah, fantastic. I hardly had any. My friends drank a lot more. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Dude, we got shit-faced. So, how do you keep your readers engaged? You focus on one Sam... And you tell them the story for a purpose, to help them with a problem. That's how you keep them engaged, is you use the language that would be meaningful to them and keep that one person engaged. So Sean Coyne has said for years and years and years, specificity breeds universality. How you get people to engage with your reading and stay engaged is make it a very, very specific story. And the way you do that is by having a very clear narrative path. You have a author telling a story to a Sam, a single audience member, and you're helping them with a problem. 
that's how you keep your readers engaged. All right. So I promised to teach you three things on this training and we would do three exercises. So valence your language to unboring your sentences, use objects of desires to write compelling characters, decide what details to include and cut to keep your reader engaged and that you would leave, well, you would leave a better writer. So did I deliver? Before we go any further, I just want to check in. I still got a few more things to teach you, and I'm going to tell you about the workshop, but I want to make sure I delivered. So just put in the chat whether or not I delivered. I'm going to grab another drink of water while you do that. Omar and Sharon say yes. Naomi say for sure. Amy say 100%. So far, so good. Yes, 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 yes. Sure. Walt says yes. I have a ton of ideas for revisions. Fantastic. Yes, you guys delivered too. Yeah, I was I was a little nervous today. I ne again never done like man. One, I hope people show up, and two, I hope they're ready to like type in the chat. Uh, very informative, mind blown. Yeah, yes, well done. Yes, great. All right. Um, good, 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 good. All right. So, let me just ask this: Do you feel like? You're a little bit better of a writer and you could take these exercises and become an even better writer. Definitely. Yes, 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 yes. I certainly hope so. Yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. Oh man, I can't keep up with all this. Hold on. Uh, I'm anxious to try it out. Hopefully. Yes, 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 yes. Easy to apply. Yes. Fantastic. Great. Okay. So what's next here? All right. So let's talk a little bit about building skills. So I feel like this is the eternal struggle when I talk to writers. Um, again, I've been doing, I've been working with writers for 15 years and it's this idea of like, is writing a set of skills that you just use over and over, or is it more like magic, right? Because, uh, you know, big magic was written by Elizabeth Gilbert. Um, so is it skills versus magic? And what we see over and over and over a story grid is this idea that skills actually unlock the magic, right? Because for every creative endeavor, no matter what it is, there is a base level of skills that you have to have in order to do the magical creative part, right? So my favorite example lately has been playing the guitar, right? My favorite guitarist, my favorite musician is a guy named Jack White from the White Stripes. And now he's a solo artist. He's also in the Racking Tours and Dead Weather. And if I hear three notes played by him, I'm like, that's Jack White. I can just tell if I'm at a coffee house and he comes on, I know it's Jack White. Now, he's playing the same notes, the same chords, the same scales as every other guitarist. And yet he's doing it in his own way. Right. So there's a base set of skills that every guitarist has to have, and then they get to go be creative and do the magical stuff. Right. That's how this works. Whether you're painting, whether you're playing the guitar, whatever it is, that's how anything creative works is you got to build the skills and then you get to do the magical part. Cause here's the really devastating thing is that when you sit down and you're writing and you're writing and you're writing, the muse will show up. And it will give you stuff. But if you don't have the skills, it won't matter. Like that's what I'm saying. You won't be able to translate what the muse gave you into actual working writing. Okay. So how do you learn those skills? And so this is what I've been obsessed with for years is how do you learn a complex skill like writing that feels magical, but is based on a set of skills, right? So the first thing you have to do is break it down into individual skills. Because when we're talking about things like writing, playing the guitar, painting, whatever it is, driving, um, it's actually one, it's like a house that a lot of little skills sit in, right? None of those things are any one skill. It's actually an amalgamation of a bunch of individual skills. So the first things you have to do is break it down into individual skills. So this is where I want to look at um, an example of if you compare the writing of Jane Austen to Chuck Pelinick, the the um, the style could not be more different, right? 
you read Pride and Prejudice, you would never think, I think Chuck Pelinek wrote this, right? If you've ever read any of Chuck Pelinek's writing, it is nothing like Pride and Prejudice. However, if you pull back the style and you look underneath, it is the same set of skills being applied, which we practice three of those skills today, right? Now, they want to call it the same thing I call it, but they're doing the same thing, all right? And so if we just look at writing a single scene, what we've seen at StoryGrid is that scene writing can be broken down into 10 basic skills, right? The five commandments, understanding genre, having consistent value shifts, starting the scene in the right place, clear objects of desire, characters act consistently, interesting dialogue, compelling protagonist, well-timed exposition, develop setting. We practice some of these today, right? We talked about figuring out objects of desire. We talked about an interesting dialogue, even though we didn't directly talk about interesting dialogue. Interesting dialogue is all about conflict and knowing what our characters want. Right? We've talked about value shifts. So we talked about some of these, but these are the writing skills. So you've got to break down this idea of writing into individual skills. And the reason that you do that is so you can actually practice them, right? And it's this idea of deliberate practice, right? Now, when we talk about breaking down skills, this is why it's important. Okay, I can't stress this enough. Look what we did on this webinar. We broke it down into a skill that we practice right now together live. We can't do that at the manuscript level. I'm not going to sit here and wait on you to write 50,000 words so we can talk about it, right? We broke it down into a skill that we could actually practice. So what is deliberate practice? So I could sit here and try to explain it to you, or I could just go to the expert, my buddy James Clear, who wrote the uh, huge best-selling book, Atomic Habits. He has this article on his website, The Beginner's Guide to Deliberate Practice. And there's a difference between normal practice and deliberate practice. So deliberate practice is purposeful and it's systematic. It requires focused attention and is conducted with a specific goal of improving performance. So this is where you look at one individual skill and you improve that performance. So a lot of times we talk about in the writing world of like, just, you know, write every day, write your 500 words a day, write your thousand words a day. And if you're not writing and you don't have that habit, that's a win. Just sitting down and churning out words. However, once you've got that down, mindless activity actually becomes the enemy of your progression. So just writing every day doesn't make it any better because here's what's happening. We assume we're getting better simply because we're gaining experience. In reality, we are reinforcing current habits, not improving them. So this is why deliberate practice is so important. So when we think about breaking down individual skills and practicing, I like to use the metaphor of learning woodworking, right? Imagine like there's all these different tools you got to use in woodworking and you've got to get really, really good at each of them. So I'm going to just practice using my hand plane over and over, learning how to do it right so that everything in the future that I create, I'm going to do a good job with it. Use the same thing with a chisel or a hammer or a saw is if I get really good at it, if I take the time to get really good at the skill, then everything I produce in the future is going to be better, right? Just because I took the time to get good at that skill. So the third part of how to learn a complex skill is to get feedback, all right? This is why writing is so hard, all right? If I am learning how to play the guitar, because I learned how to play the guitar when I was in uh, middle school and high school, and you have any decent ear for music, if I play the wrong note, I know it immediately, right? So if I'm trying to play, you know, Dave Matthews, because what else would I learn how to play when I'm in, in the 90s, uh, and I play the wrong note, I'll immediately know it because I can hear the wrong note. That's not how it works with writing. But we do not have an ear for the right, our own writing, the way that it works for music. This is why writing is so much harder to learn because you can do it wrong over and over and over and over, even when you're trying to get better and not understand how you're getting it wrong. 
And so this, I'm going to bring you back to this article on James Clear's website. So perhaps the greatest difference between deliberate practice and simple repetition is this, feedback. One consistent finding across disciplines is that coaches are often essential for sustaining deliberate practice. In many cases, it is nearly impossible to both perform a task and measure your progress at the same time. All right. And this is what we found at StoryGrid is that we can teach all of these things, but it's the feedback that makes the difference. And so this is when I started thinking a little while ago, what if I could, what if you could, what if I could do for you, spend six weeks focused on these skills in a small group where I give you some training, but then you practice. And here's the important part. I give you feedback and you get to see me give feedback to other people, right? And it's done with me. So what if I could do this? So this is what I was noodling on. I was talking to Sean about, I was talking to Leslie and Danielle about the best way to do this. And this is where we came up with this idea of, I teach a live writing workshop and we're going to focus on dialogue, right? Because there's those 10 things that we got to do and we can't do all of it. We're going to address all 10 in the six weeks with more going to really focus on dialogue because that makes a big difference. So this is a workshop that I'm running that's starting next Thursday, September 4th. And included in how this works is, again, I was thinking like, what can I do to just get you practicing and giving you ways to do practice and then get feedback and do practice and get feedback? So I'm going to start, it's going to be six live calls, 90 minutes long each, um, it's going to be, uh, I'm going to give instruction and then each week you're going to have homework. And then after that first week, um, no, September 14th, not fourth, uh, next Thursday, I don't anyway. So, uh, yeah, weekly group. And then, so during the, uh, workshop after that first week, I'm going to spend most of the time looking at your homework and giving you feedback and using that to teach, because that is what we have found is looking at your work and giving feedback is how we learn the fastest to change and watching other people get feedback on theirs is how it works as well. We're also going to have a discussion channel in a Slack group. I'm going to do daily exercises similar to what we did on today's training. Um, and the idea is in that six weeks, you're going to clearly level up your dialogue writing inside of a scene. Okay. Okay. So when we start looking at what to charge for this stuff, I just start looking out at what other things cost, right? So if I look at what one semester of an MFA in creative writing is, on the low end, you're looking at $5,000. If you're going to any kind of major private university, you're looking at $30,000. And what's crazy about this is that we have lots of people with MFAs take our uh, training. In fact, two weeks ago, I was talking to one of them and they were legitimately angry because they're like, I learned more in one month with you than with uh, my entire MFA program. If you're to hire me one-on-one, -on -one, I work with writers one-on-one -on -one to help them develop their stories. My pricing starts at $10,000, right? So that's not what I'm going to charge for this. Um, in this class, I'm going to charge $1,200 for this six-week course. And you can actually go learn more about it now at storygrid.com slash workshop. Now, one of the things I wanted to do that we're talking about, because I'm promising something big, right? I'm promising you're going to be significantly writing better at writing scenes, specifically dialogue at the end of just six weeks. And if you've been writing any length of time, that doesn't feel like very long, right? So I want to do a guarantee. So I guarantee if you get to the end of the six weeks and you feel that you have not improved as a writer, I want you to ask for your money back. That's how this is going to work. Now I will have one caveat on this. You got to actually do the work. So you got, you got to turn in your homework to get the, the money back guarantee, because I want to make sure that every single person that comes to this is committed to actually doing the work. Okay. But if you do the work and at the end, you're like, I didn't improve, that's totally fine. So again, all of this is included in the uh, program. Now you see, this is a lot. And I'm requiring you to do practice. And I'm saying I'm going to look at everybody's homework and we're going to workshop stuff live. So I can't do a uh, an unlimited amount of spots. 
So I decided I'm only letting 30 people in to make sure I can actually do this, right? Now, I've been promoting a little, a little bit already, and we've already sold 11 spots. So I only have 19 spots left, and we're starting next, uh, next Thursday, so a week from today. I cannot wait to do this. I've been so excited about this. Um, there's two ways to get a spot because again, I'm wanting to make sure that everybody uh, is a good fit for it. So if you go to storygrid.com slash workshop, you'll see you either got to fill out an application or schedule a call with me. I just want to make sure that everything, uh, that everybody's a good fit. Uh, so if I, if I, I just want to make sure you're in a place where you're going to get the most out of it. Um, some questions that um, I'm assuming you may have: When are the weekly live? Uh, when are the weekly meetings? What if I can't attend live? I'm running them at Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern, 12 p.m. Pacific. Uh, that that's on the page as well. Um, how do the practice assignments work? I'm going to tell you what to do. I'm going to give you clear instruction on what your practice is going to be, and how you turn those into me, um, so that I can actually look over them. Will your assignment be analyzed every week? Not necessarily. So what I'm going to do is go through all of them and look for common areas that people are um, making mistakes, pull out examples and go over as many examples as I possibly can live. Uh, and then how do I sign up for the workshop? Again, you've got to get a uh, call with me or fill out the application. So again, this is the Mastering Dialogue and Fiction, a live scene writing workshop. I cannot wait to do this. We're going to have a lot of fun together. And it's a really great way to practice these skills in real time and get better over the six weeks. Mastering Dialogue and Fiction class is starting next week. Would love for you to join. I have the 19 spots left. Go to storygrid.com slash workshop and check that out. You just finished watching a recording of a live training I did called Crafting Compelling Sentences. I hope you got a lot out of it and that you learned a little something that will make you a better writer. If you want to learn more about StoryGrid, make sure that you subscribe to this channel hit that bell so that you get notified of all the future trainings and videos that we put up on YouTube. Also, you can go to storygrid.com, sign up for the newsletter. That's where we send out everything new. If you don't want to miss anything that we're doing in the StoryGrid universe, we also have tons of free resources and articles at the storygrid.com website. But as always, thanks for being a writer. Thanks for being a part of our community here at StoryGrid, and I'll see you next time.